Welcome to my lecture, Globally Unified Governance Framework for Open Source. My name is Christopher Klotz and I have studied and worked both in the realms of computer and social sciences and so I have maybe a bit a different perspective on several of the current, uh, current developments. And today I want to give you an alternative perspective and also a potential approach that can help us to uh, tackle several issues. We will begin with the problems we have in the international society, so the society of sovereign states as of today. Uh, then we will have a look on the open source system, what is it? And in the end we will come to the abstraction layer, international arbitration and how it can give us possibilities we have not yet uh, used. So um, the security providers of today are of course the sovereign states, they are determined by geography, their sovereignty, and obviously uh, they are designed for purely social systems. And this leads to the question, what if the social environment is replaced by a socio-technical one? Uh, what does socio-technical mean? Um, it means blurred borders among the technical systems like the internet and the social system. There are no longer clear or distinct points of transition. There are persistent reciprocal interactions, influences and impacts. And so it's no longer possible to separate or split these two systems. They are persistently interdependent and interacting. Um, so are sovereign states in their traditional separations of powers uh, secure by design in this new environment. What does secure by design mean? It's a concept from software engineering and it shifts the focus from the bugs, the errors, the mistakes we have um, to the architecture and ask whether these are just symptoms of an architectural flaw and so fighting the bugs doesn't make a difference. Um, the first issue for us here is uh, we have to avoid single points of failure, abuse and manipulation by architecture. So in a purely social systems we have already the separations of powers that can fulfill this purpose. On the other hand, we need a predictable behavior of the system. So we need to ensure intended input to have a predictable output. I need to know what I'm allowed to do to not get punished. Otherwise a system cannot offer me security. And so this is a common approach and where we have already two single points of failure, the IT operations and the development of the IT systems um, affecting the whole social system at once. So a very well example is the solar wine sack of 2020 where many public agencies, private um, customers and people were affected because um, there was a hack in the build processes, in the build environment, uh, which is the part um, where the software we can use is created, where finally something usable. And we can have a, a comparable issue in IT operations, for example, if there is one weak password uh, from one admin, which is also was the origin of the uh, solar wine sack in IT development environment. And uh, another issue here is, of course, the consolidated federal IT agencies. And um, another issue for uh, manifest could be the, a blockchain approach as it is currently um, used or implemented in Estonia for example where we have many different blockchains to create no single point of failure of course uh, affecting one node doesn't make a difference for the remaining but um, if we have one company that proprietarily without external review develops the technology the software for all blockchains and if there is one IT agency that does, does the administration of all we have still the same two um, points of failure and then anticipating these blockchains offer me security can be very dangerous if I then use them to verify everything, legislative, judiciary, court systems, police files, healthcare and such which is planned and given the public papers we have it cannot be excluded that this will be possible and uh, the absence of full information to everything there uh, also makes it hard to determine whether they have considered everything because of the absence of external review. So what you see here is just an illustration, um, one manifest of an institutional problem because the system, the traditional system is focusing on responsibility and liability and so it needs one entity that has to take over the responsibility and thus this uh, entity also needs uh, to have the means, the full access to um, yeah to possess this responsibility. And so also the public review is something that is still partly seen as a vulnerability on itself and so there remains a focus on security through obscurity which consolidates review because external review is also a type of distribution even if I have just one agency for example and the system also anticipates 
um, that flaws imply bad work. So good work means we uh, won't have flaws and so everything will be fine and we don't need to consider it. So um, this can have many manifests and if I have multiple agencies that distribute, um, this does not necessarily make a difference if every agency can uh, create full harm. So this is just one example how it can manifest with a, a, a much deeper institutional problem. And um, we have also to see that security is much more than not getting hacked, but also um, offer the services people need. For example, um, currently we have big issues in Germany with the COVID apps that don't uh, are able to really implement um, the, not, the new regulations in an accessible, uh, accessible, um, in a suitable amount of time. So um, this approach is generally no integral part of the international society, it's no formal thing. Nothing that means getting rid of these problems implies getting rid of the international society or a sovereign state. Um, it's an informal thing and it's um, architectural, yes, it's an architectural flaw, but of a subsystem, not of the system as a whole. Um, it's an informal problem of the society and the society develops over time. It has integrated passive development where the society adjusts its behavior and its interpretations of the norms uh, and its interpretations of laws uh, when they are their traditional interpretations are no longer competitive. So this is something that can happen within the system and where the society can learn and interact with open source, public drafts, public standardization, which leads of distribution uh, to distribution and also an ongoing public review. We have already examples um, like uh, the advanced decryption standard, SHA-3, the security enhanced Linux, where public agencies or publicly strongly influenced agencies uh, like the Internet Engineering Task Force or um, in terms of IS and SHA-3, the National Institute of Standardization and Technology strongly interact with open source and possess open source institutions. They have adopted public drafts, public standardization. So we see open source and international society. We cannot just say these are two entities. It's the institutions that make up uh, what it, what we are up against and so it's a, also a blurred thing and you can only see um, is it open source by institutions and so um, it's also a blurred thing and there are public agencies and publicly strongly influenced uh, entities that are already part uh, of the open source system and so we have also many implementations already where uh, systems are using open source uh, supporting it and using publicly reviewed systems for example Linux and have also distributed types of operations of review. So um, once again, the graphics is just an illustration, um, multiple possibilities, how I can create distribution, but also within an agency, not just among different ones. So the architectural flaw lies here in a subsystem. It's not a general issue. And so we can mitigate it by alternative subsystems, but it's more than just fighting the bugs and something that means replaceable norms from within. Um, how the system tackles approaches it's approaches but um, it's a bigger issue when we come to here um, we have in terms of predictable behavior um, state one a customer he's the customer of a, of a company in state two and uh, this company processes its data in state three but storage is done in state four and this leads us indirectly to problems to bugs like how to enforce european institutions on telegram which is in uae a current problem in the european union but also a very old issue, how to enforce European privacy institutions when uh, data is stored in the United States, which also, which also wants to protect its territorial integrity and its own laws. So uh, we can tackle each one of these on its own, but finally there is an architectural flaw. And uh, it's comparable when we have the GPL um, version 2, whichever can be different and interpreted in different states. Um, and also within a state that can have different uh, interpretations because these are not legal terms and they are so very ambitious and can be interpreted in different ways by a judge and they are not integral in neither state. And they are interpreted and derived from the legal constants of the traditional system. They are not prepared for the transnational dynamic socio-technical system because this new system is much has much more dynamics, is persistently developing and it, it has not this integrated development of the society, which is passive. And so, um, as it's also asynchronous developing, if we have a, a well precedent or a well law in, on day one, on day two, everything can have changed. And so the system needs to 
start again by zero. And also in a different case, things can be differently interpreted. So in Germany, I can own something, I can possess something and I can use something. But if I use a library, what's the difference to forking code? And what's the difference between a static link or a dynamic link of a library? So this is heavily probabilistic in, in terms of a traditional system. And so I cannot have security here. And um, so a question for the lawyers, uh, how stare is the agency of a stare diseases, um, which is representative for uh, what our current system wants to achieve? How uh, stare is it in the socio-technical dynamics of code? So only dynamics can balance dynamics. And so if I try to seek or to get a static um, condition on one side, I cannot foresee how it will act when there is a change on the other side. So it will be even worse in the situation possibly. So in the current social system, um, we have the interpretation of laws that develops with the society. And this gives us a static feel. It's a passive process. Um, of the society, but the code does not develop with these informal dynamics. Um, it's a completely different thing, but that's not an issue because the code itself is unbiased, it's maths, it's physics, and it has a static dynamics because the dynamics can be anticipated, how it will develop, evolve. Uh, we know what we are up against. And so this is not an issue. We have the static dynamics of code uh, in this other system that have to be considered as such and that offer us a, a constant security. And so from the perspective of socio-technical open source system, the traditional system um, contains inconsistency among interpretations and thus among cases. And so um, a judge can anticipate, we can anticipate that he knows it's, it's law, but um, what is, is the difference, the relation between library and unexecutable for him? He doesn't really know much about it and his law doesn't help him really. So it's very probabilistic again, and so we have no reliable consistency or predictable behavior here, and thus a lack of security. So, uh, and if we input data into a system for which it does not intend it, um, I have the same thing on, on a Linux. Um, it wouldn't behave different. It's unpredictable behavior. It will be a kernel panic. And so we are talking here about architectural flaws that have to be considered that way, and this leads us to the open source system. Um, first, as a comparison, we have the geographical separations in the dominant sovereign states, and we have functional separations in open source. So geography is really a secondary thing. It's more about are you a kernel developer? Are you a tester of a distribution? Are you one of the management guys? So it's a functional thing and everything else is secondary. And instead of the separations of powers, which is a type of command economy in itself, we have a distribution of powers, which is competition. And it captures the dynamics of code, the, uh, the, the static dynamics of code within this distribution of powers, capturing the development. Um, so does the, the, the interpretation of laws is um, changing with the society, for example. So um, it's a balancing, it's self balancing thing. On the other hand, we have also responsibility and liability focus in a traditional system. We had initially already talked about it. And we have an individual focused chain of trust in open source mo uh, in many cases, um, which is also a very different uh, thing. So the major institutions for open source are forking redundancy and transparency, um, which also link already to Linux law and flaw anticipation. So forking means that um, I can use any code if I disagree with uh, how it develops, how things are done, and uh, create something else just by forking, using it and create something new. And we have a lot of redundancy. So uh, build processes, uh, we have many different build processes where the, the Linux kernel is tested. Um, there is much redundancy in review codes um, are tested, reviewed and such. And um, this also needs transparency, otherwise it doesn't work. And so these are the major institutions where flaws are anticipated and just one problem that has to be solved as any other problem. It's, it's nothing where you talk about fault. It's something new in the system because it's actively developing itself and not passively. And so we have also within the communities a rough consensus that is driven by merit paced uh, person. So, for example, Linus Torvalds, who is more or less deriving the consensus of the Linux kernel community. Um, and so this gives a one person a lot of theoretical power um, where we can have a very efficient development. But uh, it's still a very good balanced power because if someone disagrees 
we have still the possibility of forking through redundancy and transparency. And so there, these people like Linus Torvalds are still affected by competition with others. And the constant obviously uh, remains the code. And because of these asynchronous development, we are we have a rolling release model in this technical open source system, in the socio-technical open source system. Um, it's no anticipation of a static environment it, because we are doing the development actively and so we are anticipating the development and not seeking something static. Um, just we are seeking the static behavior of the development of code. Um, we, can, we know its dynamics, how they will develop. So um, this already captures the dynamics of the code, creating competition based distribution of powers. We have many different communities within, uh, with our, in most cases, rough consensus driven some in different ways. And uh, if you disagree with it, you can always create forks, which happens from time to time. This does not have to have uh, hostile reasons. And forking is easy because of redundancy and transparency. Also in terms of standardization, not just uh, in, in new protocols and such, it's not just software development. So um, is this security critical? Um, the majority of websites are Linux driven, um, given the fact that uh, just 0.3% uh, are not Linux. Of those we know, it, you can anticipate that a majority of the unknown sites are also Linux. Um, when it comes to company who spend money to get security that they can rely on their operating systems, 34% rely on Red Hat Linux, just one of many different Linux distributions, so the Linux market share in general will be much more. And uh, Cisco and Juniper themselves have 44% uh, in the market of the service providers. So the providers of the internet that run the infrastructure where all the traffic of the internet goes uh, is passed through, and uh, their current, their new systems are all based on Linux and there are many more providers that are maybe also using Linux but um, where I couldn't get reliable information and also 70% of the phones people use are Linux driven by a modified kernel and so this is also not just about hacks but about services. It's for me today an important part of security to be reachable, to have access to Signal, WhatsApp, to be able to buy something on Amazon, to rely that my system is able to manage uh, the output of the Amazon website. So this is all belonging to security as of today. And despite the opportunities when I get malware, can get malware into the Linux kernel, there is no exploitation until today. So there's a reason for that which not, uh, does also include a chain of trust, of course, which is also a related institution. Um, and despite its dominance, the Linux community still does not behave like a dominant market player. This is something we have to consider. Um, it has stable competition within and around. And there's much more protocol, standardization and software we are using. And also libraries and things like WebKit are also the, uh, part of proprietary system. For example, Safari uses WebKit uh, in its Coras engine and uh, much software proprietary uses open source libraries. So we cannot really foresee how much this is. And because of the development, which is active, unlike the social system where society de develops passive, the development and maintenance have to, have to be considered on themselves in the development, uh, in, in security aspects, because it's done actively. Um, and so this is also something the traditional system is not prepared for. This is how it looks. We have the development, like of the Linux kernel, where the open source system is more or less on itself next to anarchy, um, doing the work on itself. Um, but in most cases, of course, it's still subordinated to the international society. In some cases, it even gives security to its communities uh, by managing unseatable precedents or laws or, of the system. So. Uh, what can what does techno technology do in such cases? It creates abstraction layers. We have running systems we cannot simply replace, Windows, Linux, whatever. We can create an abstraction layer on top that gives us the possibility to have an application that can be run on everything. Comparable, we have it with Ceph, um, where we needed simplification, where um, it was no longer possible that one file system could seed any need we have, especially in terms of distribution. Um, and so everything out we had an output was too complicated and so we now just use the systems we already have which we are used to that are running everywhere we cannot get replaced everywhere um, just 
uh, within an hour or so. And so we can still use them for what we are doing traditionally and just we added another abstraction layer like an another application um, to add the distribution. So abstraction layers can make a big difference and they can also help us to give the judge something his system is intended for, but we have to consider the institutions that are important for us, not just in this case at another curve as we know it. So the big issue here is um, the convention of New York 5859. This does not introduce international arbitration, but just gives an international foundation to enforce arbitration awards more or less globally. And so the relevant implementation of the arbitration law is always the national one. Um, so the law of the arbitration body and it's ir irrelevant um, where the parties are placed. So we have also much security here and an award can be enforced globally by, by the state system itself. But we give the judge something he knows he's intended for. He has just to verify the compliance of the arbitration case to the arbitration agreement and of the arbitration agreement to its national law. And in the case of an arbitration body, uh, always the national implementation of the law. So this is something he's intended for. And we can use it more or less globally because you see in blue, the majority of states of the world are member states of this convention to enforce an arbitration award. Two examples you can get into to have some uh, illustration of what, we are up, what this is all about. And so some, how, what can we do with the system here? What can it be enhanced and how to add this abstraction layer? This is what we will have an international arbitration abstraction layer for the open source system um, for create security for both sides and it will be also complementary for the society, international society because through the international arbitration we help the international society through open source system to also fill the remaining gap with this arbitration concept it is used to, it knows how to handle it. And uh, so it's a symbiosis more or less we're talking about. And in terms of Swiss arbitration just one example, we can have also many other states that have suitable laws like UK or such. Um, it has two laws, but it, uh, we are free to choose which one we want to apply. And so only the highest court of Switzerland, this one court, um, treats cases against arbitration issues. Other courts are not allowed to do so. And so we have much specialization experience and knowledge, which gives us security. Um, and also the public and politics in Switzerland tend to facilitate such implementations, socio-technical things. Uh, in Zug, you can already pay public agencies with cryptocurrencies. We have the Facebook-driven DM Association, so the regulated Libra currency. Um, and we have uh, just, was just passed a new law to further facilitate international arbitration. And just a little additional incentive, partly related to here, um, can such a regulated cryptocurrency, which is also possible in Switzerland, be complementary because it can give us the possibility for a global stable type of transnational currency, which is backed by a stable transnational legal framework, which gives us the possibility for linking the source and its exchange, which is today, of course, in most cases, a service thing, um, which can also drive development um, because a legal frame, stable framework and a currency and a stable one. It's also a big issue that can give us uh, access to even more contributors worldwide. And some incentives for this arbitration thing, what could prove competitive, what we have to maybe consider uh, instead of just adding an, a, a new occurred, um, it has to be tailored, of course, for the rolling needs of this new system, um, which also differs strongly because it is uh, based on community. And, not on deterrence because we can anticipate in this system that people who are engaging in the social technique open source system have a very high human development and so it's more competitive to anticipate community rather than crime um, because the system and its dynamics its efficiency the flexibility already we know that it automatically gets rid of a behavior that is not competitive for the system so it's already very efficient um, and so here it makes sense to go more towards also within a code towards collaboration because it's just problems we are up against that have to be solved to have to create uh, security for the future and not punishment which is done by the system already um, and also by the criminal law uh, which is also something that is not part of the arbitration but where the arbitration can also um, which can be complemented by it um, another issue that is already widespread in, uh, in open source self-certification, for example, 
um, for code coverage or for implementing best practices, where you can have rules that just have a, a shawl, which means you don't must, um, but where the self-certification means a company says, hey, we are implementing this, we are making the shawl to a must, and so an arbitration would also treat this entity that way when it uh, comes to a, a, an arbitration. And so it's also something that gives us security, flexibility for future. And so constructs like the Linux kernel development or the ITF are maybe more suitable indication than traditional curts here. And we have also to consider the back ports. Um, so if we make a, a global rule, we have also to think of what will be the different differences in local implementations. So how does local systems behave to it? Um, how to make local entities aware of what are the differences for you with this new rule? Um, so this is something important that has to be considered on itself. Um, in terms of intangible property, we already know um, it becomes more and more services uh, rather than products because um, it's hard to implement in such a system. So it makes sense in such an arbitration to simply assume everything is open and the intentional property protection is not our business, but has to be done separately in another traditional court. Um, it's important to keep the system transparent, redundant, and also forkable uh, by statutes. Um, and this links also to the question, has a lawsuit to be in advance, or can it be done just like the development in the system where we have debates, for example, among arbitrators, how they will treat a case if it will happen based upon the rules done possibly by maintainers or so. Um, because the bureaucracy we want to avoid in the normal system is here not necessary, this avoidance, because the system already competes towards efficiency in the realms of code anyway. We know this. So here we can also create um, or add further security if we keep for sure that there is the distribution given the forkability and such and um, implement the standards, the system, the open source system and its distribution of powers is used to. And of course, we have to carefully uh, identify stakeholders, maintainers of the rules, arbitrators, the users, developers, and whatever. And the, of course, the question remains, how much of this can be really implemented um, in a real arbitration law, which also has uh, rules. And so what I'm talking here about, uh, my incentives are really just implicitly legal and nothing explicit. And so a lawyer can come to the conclusion that uh, maybe much is not possible. and. Of course, uh, we have to consider that. And the transition of the existing licenses is also a bit problematic, which uh, has to be considered on itself. And so um, always consider architectural flaws and bugs are different things and have to be considered um, respectively. And so now I'm looking forward to your questions. And given the very short Q&A period we have now, feel free to do some background investigation and add further question on the GitHub site I've set up for this. Uh, or other comments. So looking forward to your comments.